Hi everyone. This is the first in a series of videos I'm making documenting the production of a woodblock print. The design is by Hiroshi Yoshida and it's called Niko, Hiri no Hi, or Misty Day in Niko. This video is going to be all about the carving of the key block, the dark lines of the print. It's needed for defining all other areas that will be carved on sequential chord blocks later. These are the first cuts on a new block, and you can see I'm a little hesitant at the beginning. This is no easy job, and there's nothing but delicate lines on this print, and Yoshida has a lot of character in every line, so it's not straightforward, smooth carving. I'll loosen up a little as we go along. The work began by preparing a hanshita, the tracing I made of all the black lines um, using a reference of the original. But this video is already far too long, so I've omitted it from this video. It took about 10 days to trace, and without going into too much detail, but I will say it was quite a tricky job. The lines were very difficult to see in the reference material. It has so many colour overlays, it was quite hard to figure out what is key and what is colour at some points. How successful it was, we'll find out a little bit later. But for now, let's just enjoy some carving. The original image was produced in 1937. The print belongs to a class of prints dating between 1926 and 1989, described as Shinhanga, which literally translates as new prints. Shinhanga prints are very distinctive and have many more colour overlays than the typical ukiyo print that you may have seen from the likes of Hiroshiga and etc. They were really built from the ground up, adding and overlaying colours to create depth and subtle interplays in tones and colour. Inspired by the Impressionists of the West, but with still a heavy emphasis on the brushwork and traditions, often they have a looser and more realistic feel as compared to the more heavily stylized ukiyo tradition which typically leans more towards smooth and clearly defined coloration. While the Shinhanga movement differs from ukiyo in a number of ways, it still retains the collaborative structure of the previous eras. That is, the quintet of workers um, needed to produce one of these prints, including the designer, whose names you see attached to all the prints, the publisher, the printer and the carver. Although it's not the only way to produce these prints, this same structure is still used today in all major publishing in Japan, as each of the roles is highly specialised. I'm training in the latter discipline, that of the carver. You'll notice that I don't move the block while carving. The kento, two little notches, on the block used to register the paper during printing are at the bottom of the block, with the wood grain running horizontally across it. This grain directionality will become very important when we get to clearing. You can see that I'm using both sides of the blade, the beveled and the flat edge. The flat edge is the main cutting edge. But in order to cut a full 360 with the block stationary, we, I use both sides of the knife. So when cutting any shape, I start from the outside of any larger structure, any larger shape, and I work my way in. But each individual line is cut from the inward facing side or the inner curve of a line and then the outside. You can see with these tree branches here that I'm first cutting the inside of the curve and then I'll cut the outside. This is because it's more difficult to touch up a shape from the inside. It's not so bad when we have straight lines, but on curved lines it becomes very difficult to touch up from the inside of a line, inside of a curve. It's much easier to refine from the outside. came to Japan in September 2018 
and began working on my own to produce some pieces so that I could show it to a carver in order to become an apprentice. I worked by myself for about six months until my hand was forced by a phone call by Matsumura-san from Woodlake Matsumura, one of the last places that produces mountain cherry blocks we use. After visiting the shop a number of times to buy wood blocks, he said I should talk to his friend, Asuka Motoharu, since I seemed pretty interested in carving. I told him that I was very much aware of him and I would like to become his apprentice. I am also not quite ready to meet him as I want something decent to show him before I ask to be his apprentice. Either my Japanese was very poor or he just decided to dismiss what I said, but then he very um, kindly called Asuka Sensei right then and there, explaining that he had some foreigner here who keeps buying wood blocks from him and he wants to be your apprentice. So I met him and after a year to the day of taking classes, trying to prove myself dedicated and good enough to, for him to take me on as an apprentice. Asuka Sensei then one day with no fanfare just casually called me his apprentice and that was it. So since April of 2020, um, I've been working as an apprentice at Takumi Hanga. At the end of 2020, I made my first block set for Moko Hankan. I'm producing that year's New Year card called Winter Village. Since then, I've done odd jobs here and there for Moko Hankan. But this is the first large sized, large scale project I'm making for Dave. It's a really big deal to be trusted with something like this. It's kind of difficult to express my gratitude to him and everyone else who's helped me along on my way so far. But that topic deserves its own video. So the first stage, I'm using all just one tool. I'm using this knife. In Japanese, it has a few different names. It goes by chokokuto, kogatana, or hangito. It's held in a loose grip on the front pads of your fingers. If you clench your fist, you really lose all the flexibility that is needed to carve curved lines and flicks of the brushes without moving the block. So it's got to be a light grip on the very front pads. I'm really only gripping the blade with my little finger and I'm pressing down from the top of my thumb. The other three fingers are just there to support. So it's a pivot between the little finger and the thumb. Lines are thought of as being either alive or dead after carving, and it's a really fine line between the two. It took me a long time to understand the difference between the two. To carve a line that has some life in it, it's always best to cut it correctly first time. It is possible to shave and shape after the fact, but nailing the taste of the line when shaving is not so easy. So the perfect carver would hit it once and be done. No further strokes, no fixing in post, bam, one and done. But we're not perfect. So you'll see I'll come in a couple of times with some lines, not quite hit it on the first one. With time, I'll get better. By the time Yoshida came about, the technology for producing metal key blocks was already on the table and he really jumped at it. Most all of his works are made using metal key blocks, perfectly transcribing his brushed lines into metal through uh, acid etching techniques. There's a good chance that this is the first time this print has ever had its lines carved into wood.
any line done by a brush has a front side and a back side. It's called omote and ura in Japanese. And it's very important for a carver to understand this if they want to carve living lines. Whereas a Japanese person would be brought up doing shodo, that's Japanese calligraphy, all through their schooling and inherently sort of have an understanding of how brush lines work. Moving to Japan later in life, I was told by my teacher that I should take um, shodo lessons. Not just to better understand how to cut kanji that I would later have to carve in a lot of work, but also to better understand the mark making of a brush, to better understand the characteristics of a brush, the omote anura. It's something I really need to get back to doing more of. One of the most frequent questions I'm asked is, how deep to cut? And the answer anybody in this field will give you is, it depends. When lines are close, they're cut to one depth. And when they stand alone on the edge of an abyss, it's very different, relatively speaking. But as a rule of thumb, 1.2 millimeters is kind of a sweet spot. We want about one millimeter of depth on any typical line, close to other sporting features. And you need a slight safety net when coming in and cutting with your flat chisels. So if you're trying to do some carving on your own, it's a good starting point, about 1.2. In the beginning, I went too hard and would often cut too deep, and that's not good for a number of reasons. One, it weakens the lines. Um, two, it encourages pigment buildup. And then I started to counteract that, so I was cutting shallower, and I started to focus more on the nuance of the lines, and I developed the tendency to cut a little too shallow which is very frustrating when clearing. Anytime I have to switch tool, it's a little reminder that you're not quite good enough yet. It's a constant battle between correcting mistakes and then overcorrecting, but slowly and surely, the pendulum swing gets smaller and smaller and we get closer to cutting correctly. So I'm looking over the back of my hand here. You can see what my supporting hand is doing. My whole hand rests on the block. My index finger is raised up and I use it as a rest for the blade. Floating a knife in the air with a single pivot point is very unstable. So the index finger is there as another point of contact for the blade. It's very important not to, and it's something you see a lot of beginners doing, is they use that finger to push the blade along. You mustn't push, it's just there as an anchor. The best analogy I can think of is to use it like the rollock of a paddle boat. You can press against it, you can push off it, but never the other way around. Camellia oil is really useful and it has a number of applications, both for carving and printing. Here I'm using it to make the lines more visible. Just a touch on the area I'm about to carve makes the paper texture and the white of the paper almost completely disappear. You do need to be careful as if you add too much or leave it on for too long it can cause the paper to peel off the block. This is why I add just little dabs just before carving. Also you'll see that sometimes I apply it to tissue or remove the excess with the tissue. The little squeezy bottles it comes in often dispense too much oil at once. So to avoid this, I've taken to squirting it on a little piece of folded tissue and then rubbing that onto the block. It works really well. Later you'll see some other uses for the camellia oil when we're using the flat chisels. Here we get started on the carving of the faces. Um, this is the most consequential part of the carving as these are the the most visible things. These are the things your eyes are drawn to um, when you look at the print. 
people's faces are always very um, important areas of the print where you can get away with some maybe subpar carving in some of the lines, grain lines on the tree. Here in the face, you've really got to nail it. So you can see again where I'm starting the carving here. I'm starting from the inside of the hat and after I carve the inside, I'll move to the outside. But gradually working down, down, down to the middle center of the face. When carving, there are four main movements uh, I am doing here. The first comes from the center of mass, so swiveling from the hips. This is where we get the big motions from, positioning our body in the right place. And we can, uh, over longer lines, you can use it to draw across from the center of mass. The next would be the elbow. The elbow swings out, comes in. The third comes from the wrist. This is for finer details and finer adjustments. And the very last one you'll see me carving on these thin lines is that I'm using my thumb. Small touches from the top of your thumb to subtly direct the tip of the knife. The inside top of any curve is a little bit tricky. I do a couple of cuts either side that overlap each other. I cut down the left side of the curve with the flat of the blade. And I do the same with the right side using the beveled. If you turn the block, this aspect is no big deal. It's just any other curve. But on a stationary block to cut the left, I'm squeezing around and twisting my body all the way to the left my elbows tighten against my body and then on the right i'm fully twisted the opposite direction and my elbows swung right out here's what i was talking about again on an earlier section i was carving i think it's a little easier to see like this These movements, along with my head popping in and out, um, makes it incredibly difficult to film a lot of these shots. Sometimes my body's completely blocking the camera, the other time my hand's in front of the lens. So some of these shots can get a little bit awkward and it can be a bit tough setting up the camera on one side and moving it then over to the other side. I guess the solution is a second camera in the future. Yay, double the footage to edit. So usually this process is left to the end, but on a delicate area like the face, um, I don't want to leave it till the end if the lines get smudged or they come off. There could be a problem during clearing and I could, it's easy to make mistakes. And so it's safer to clear as you go, but obviously it's not as efficient. So typically we'd leave this type of clearing to the end, but on the face here, I'll do a little bit now. Throughout this video, you will have been seeing me pick up the knife when I get to a crossing or an edge. For the length of the line and all my 
major cuttings, the blade is held at a certain angle. The more of the tip that's in the wood, the more stable the blade is, the straighter it wants to cut. But when you get to an adjoining line like this, the angle just won't cut close enough to the line to get the full depth. Not only do the lines need to be cut at somewhere around 70 degrees, this angle does change in certain circumstances, but it also needs to be at that angle where two lines meet right in the corner. How I solve this is by cutting up just before the line and then stopping, maintaining the angle and then rotating my wrist down. And with the top of my finger, really just pressing into that last little bit of the corner. You'll see me do this over and over on the block. Cut up to a line, lift, rotate, press. This is the very last line on the block, so after this is done, we'll move on to other stages. There's a number of stages in carving any block. This is the first stage cutting the line that we're just about to finish up here. The next stage would be getting the, the large U chisels out. Carving's done, onto the clearing. So when clearing to prevent um, the wood splitting and running and ripping up lines, there's a very particular way that we do that. With the Kenta at the far side now, we have our stopper on the left and the Kenta at the right. So I cut the outside of all the curves on the right and then also the inside of all the curves. Once we've finished that, we'll move on to the second stage. So once we've cleared everything with the registration to the right, we'll turn the block over and we'll carve everything with the registration to the left. So you can see that the, the registration marks are on the other side. And we'll carve it exactly the same way. After we finish that side, we'll turn the block again on one of its sides. I, I choose the side depending on the wood grain. We're going with the grain now. So we have to be a bit more careful. This is the clearing pattern when we're carving on the sides. Any lines, we're going to follow the wood grain on this. But still we're keeping that shape in mind. Once I finish the clearing in this position, I'll flip it around and that'll be all four orientations for the U-gouge work and all lines will be cleared all the way around. I'm getting about half a mil away from each line ideally. We start with a large U. The bigger, the quicker the process goes. And once we've done that, we've got most of the areas cleared out. What we do then is we move down to a, a smaller U gouge. 
So I'm at the studio, and so I pass the block off to my teacher, who then took a red marker and um, checked off some areas that I hadn't gone close enough to the lines or perhaps needed to be a little deeper. He finds a small um, little line here that I haven't cut. So I'll go and touch that up and continue with my clearing. The further we get from the lines, the deeper we need to carve, up to a total depth of around 4 millimeters at its deepest. I never did really like these sorts of measurements though. When you're looking down at the block and you're carving a big valley, you've got this little line standing out which is your zero point. What is 4 millimeters is not easy to measure when there's nothing surrounding it. For me, the thing I found most helpful for understanding the, the right depth to carve to, how deep to carve the lines, is to look at old blocks. Or if you don't have them, go make a block, print it. Don't just print it once, do it loads of times. And you'll, if you haven't carved something deep enough or your valleys are too shallow, you, your prints will tell you. If it's too shallow, you'll slowly build up an intuition for these kinds of things. It's things like this that I think it's the reason a traditional apprenticeship is 10 years long. Most of the techniques you learn in the first couple of weeks, how to hold a knife, how to use your body, pasting an image on the block, but you can't do any of them. It, you know it intellectually, but it takes time to build up the intuition when, where, and how to do these things until you get to a point where you no longer need to think about doing them. They just get done. I'm still working on it. Now that the large areas have been cleared, I put the hammer down and take a chisel with a slight curve in it and I use it to smooth out any lumps formed between the U-gouge and the flat clearers or any rough area where the grain was acting up. I'm using my body weight here, pressing down, even pushing my chest into the top of my hand on the chisel. Once I've done this with all the big bits, I then come in with a smaller handheld slight curve. It's called a saw eye normie and smooth out any last bits. Then it's time to get in between all these lines with the smaller u gouges. I have two sizes for this and I work with the bigger one first until completion and then I switch to the smaller one.
All the chisels are cut to my hand's dimension, and the chisel sits pressed into the crook of my thumb. The pointer, index, and ring finger support it on three sides, and the little finger rests on the block as support. The resting hand then supports with one or two fingers on the chisel and the rest pressing into the block. By pressing the thumb forward with the weight of my body behind it, the possible travel of the chisel is only a short distance and it really helps to reduce the risk of slipping and taking out lines at this stage that you've spent however long carving. Other things I'm doing here are giving the chisel a little sideways rocking sliding motion in and away from the lines. I'm doing this to help me find where the cut is and to run along it so that I'm not undercutting the lines so that they'll chip. I've chipped a fair few lines in my time, something that's not impossible to fix but it's a real pain and takes a bunch of time. Nowadays, the area I'm most concerned about is the tips of the lines. They're very delicate, and if you hit a bad grain or you haven't cut deep enough, they're very easy to lose the tips. Here's another application for the chamele oil. I have a jar with some cloth saturated in chamele oil. I use a toothbrush to rub it into the block it has a few benefits when clearing. The first is that it makes the cuts more visible. It also helps the chisel to glide smoothly through the wood. And it also conditions the steel. It's not necessary, but it does feel really good. These are the Kento, the registration system. The final stage on this block for me is to shave them down into their final position before taking an impression. I don't want any hard edges here that could leave an embossing on the paper. I'm taking special care. When the registration is very close to the principal area, something I do is shave down the back and bring the registration marks overall height a little lower than the principal area. This protects the barren from being damaged during printing. Sharp edges can catch on barrens and tear them. Then the same is done on the other side. The area just to the left of the registration here, this is the area that should be the deepest on the block. When you place the paper into the registration, um, the paper bends and this is the part where the paper will dip the lowest. So you really got to be careful there. Something I'm constantly thinking about during the clearing process are the printers. I want to make their lives as easy as I can so that I can get a good reputation. I want printers to hear my name attached to a block and think, oh, this is gonna be a nice, easy job. I don't want them to have to faff around with any high spots or, or have any unnecessary fiddliness when working with them. The clearing's now finished. And it's time to wash the paper and the glue off the block and get to some test printing. Let's see how those lines turned out.
When I was young, say 12 or 13, I heard a talk that affected me quite a bit. It was a segment about finding something you love to do. It goes something like, somebody is interested in everything and anything you can be interested in, you'll find others that are also interested. The general message was to find something you enjoy doing and damn the money. Do something because you love it and that's how you become a master and then the money will follow. So unconsciously, and this is something I've really reflected on later, I had a really insatiable appetite for hobbies and trying my hand at new things. I was always looking for the next thing I could get pretty good at before I moved on. I guess I've got quite an obsessive personality and when I'm doing something it becomes my whole world. I don't think anybody out there would say that was an unfair evaluation. Nowadays I see a lot of things about flow state and in old Japan there was this concept called mushi, a state of like no mind, a non-clingy sort of focus, a focus that's not really aware of itself and just is. I think it's like a drug <laughs> and I think it's the idea of finding that feeling that's led me to trying so many things that I could maybe someday master. The idea of mastering something was always really sexy to me. I, I was so determined to find that thing. So after a childhood of really searching for that thing I could do, I knew the feeling immediately. I knew the feeling intimately, that sort of intangible focus you only get when something really gets its hooks into you completely. And when I did finally bite the bullet and said, right, let's give this carving thing a go, I ran out to the shops and got something that was vaguely appropriate to start carving. As soon as I put that knife in the wood, I felt something. And after five minutes, I'd already declared that I was going to become a carver, rain or shine. It sounds impulsive, but put in its context, I really don't think it is. Hi, thank you for watching to the end of the video. Um, like I said, this is the first in a series of videos I'm making on this print. Um, I'm already into the color separation now, but it's quite tricky. Uh, at this point, I've spent longer trying to figure out which colors go where than I have actually carving the color blocks, but I have a few already done. Um, it's gonna take a little bit of time for the second video to come out please be patient, it's, it's coming. Um, I know there's lots to talk about in these videos and I know there's lots of things that some people would be, find very interesting like how I sharpen and things like that. I don't want them to become too lectury these videos so um, I'd like to add talks of prints and techniques and um, thoughts I'm having while carving so there's a little bit of something for everyone hopefully um, yeah please be patient for the second video thanks for watching bye peace happy carving last thing here's a sneak peek